Hey everybody, this is Greg, aka Crazy G from NECR and New England Concert Reviews, and today we have a very special guest, a different genre from what I'm used to, as you all know, a genre that I love and followed for many, many years, and his name is Joe Lewis Walker from the Joe Lewis Walker Band. Hey man, thanks for taking the time to speak with us here at NECR. How are things? Oh, it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate you having me, and uh, thank you. Uh, keep running off to the grindstone, so to speak. I hear you there. Got to do it every day, right? For those who might not have heard of blues artist Joe Lewis Walker before, can you give us just a brief little background on some of your work? Well, um, you know, I'll try to make it brief, but if anybody wants to really, um, a sort of an in-depth thing, all I do is got to go on my website or just go on, uh, just push Joe Lewis Walker on, uh, on YouTube. You'll see videos. You'll be pushing on um, the internet. You'll see many articles. You'll see many, many pictures. So, uh, let me say, I've been uh, playing guitar since I've been about 12 years old, um, quite a while, about 51 years actually. And I um, started in the Bay Area and I left home about 16 uh, performing at the clubs there. I went to junior high school a half a block away from the Fillmore Auditorium. Uh, there before the hippies came, we when the hippies were there and played after they left, after it was over. So um, I sort of was into all kind of music. Of course, I played a lot of gospel and with jazz musicians, with uh, psychedelic funk, a lot of stuff. Blues is sort of my mother tongue. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to be uh, sort of the house guitarist at a little club called The Matrix, which was owned by a guy named Marty Ballard of the Jefferson Airplane at the time. And I got a gig there through a guy named Ron McKernan, better known as Pigpen. He played organ with the um, Grateful Dead. They lived about a block and a half away from me. I lived on Waller and Ashbury. They lived on Ashbury between Waller and uh, Frederick, which was about a block and a half Cape and Ashbury. So it was uh, just a big mixed time. Everybody was, you know, finding their legs and stuff like that. And a lot of the guys became well known and some of the guys lived uh, to enjoy it from didn't and, and ladies and uh, I performed uh, lived in Chicago I performed uh, there in the 60s uh, lived in Toronto performed there in different places in England other than France and my musical career has taken a sort of circuitous route in that um, I was known for blues but I've also been part of the Thelonious Monk Institute we've played all over the world uh, at the Institute to foster understanding between cultures and races and sanctioned by uh, UNESCO the United Nations uh, the head of it is uh, Herbie Hancock and T.S. Monk Pony and a bunch of musicians across uh, John Ross uh, perform April 30th every year for the um, International Day of Jazz as well as doing concerts during the year and um, with Blues for Peace uh, and also with uh, Bread and Roses meaning for Farina's organization with Old Jam John Pius Blake up there so um, I, I sort of come out of the, um, the generation uh, where we um, we were discovering things uh, where I lived at we um, invented FM radio free concerts in the park basically jam bands <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was a lot of stuff going on I'm sort of a uh, a product of all of those influences and, and backgrounds. And, and uh, glad that I got to be quite honest about the great time. And all those musicians that I came up with uh, were groundbreakers. They were really groundbreakers. So that's sort of sure composite. Um, if you want to get in detail, you can see a lot of the things, other things I've done. Uh, I lived with a great musician named Mike Moonfield for quite a while in Mill Valley, California. And that really opened some doors for me. And Mike helped me back in the day. And different people have helped me during my life. You know, Muddy Waters helped me uh, by letting me open up for him uh, two weeks at a time in Toronto in the 70s, stuff like that. So, I mean, I've been fortunate and I try to be the same way with other musicians that uh, these guys were with me. I gotta tell you, man, wasn't it a great time? I was born in the 60s. I just started, as I grew up, I started getting into all of that around 1970, 71, when I first started listening. And some of the things you've mentioned is, is it was a beautiful time, man. It really was. Things change, unfortunately. <laughs> and a lot of great artists came out of those years. You have a new CD out called Everybody Wants a Piece. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what went into making that CD? Well, I was, um, I've made, um, it's like a, a triumvirate CD. It's like three CDs with a, sort of the same sort of uh, focus. Um, the first CD was called Hellfire and the second was called Hornet Death. And those were on the Alligator label. And uh, Everybody Wants a Piece, um, I was approached by Mascot Records, the label I was on, Provo, Mascot Provo, in 2002. Uh, and they had three blues artists, so to speak, of a brutes artist, because it was most, mostly known, uh, we were like leased to, from Shrapnel Records, and Shrapnel started a blues label called Better Blues Bureau, and they leased to a uh, mascot over in Europe, and they had three blues guys, uh, myself, uh, Robin Ford, and uh, 
uh, young Joe Bonamassa. And uh, so when time came up for me to make fast forward to make another record, uh, my uh, responsibilities to Alligator had been fulfilled, and we had a great time on the label. And uh, I was approached by a mascot, and um, we pulled the trigger on that. And so um, because it's more of a guitar-driven label with Kenny Wayne Shepard and, and Joe and Robin Ford and, and uh, Eric Johnson and, and Robert Cray and me and Walter Child. And so um, I felt, felt comfortable with that. So this record, the last three records have been, I've been trying to um, appeal to younger ears. There's a lot of younger people that are into the blues. And, and as it is, the blues means many things to many people. And so um, I, I just sort of ramped it up a little bit and, uh, you know, um, made it a little bit accessible to younger people's ears. You know, I mean, if, if you're 15, you tend to listen to maybe Stevie Ray before you get to Albert King. You know, Steve, one of Stevie's influences. There's a tendency, you know, to listen to uh, Joe Balamasso before you listen to the three kings that he did to her about B.B. Abbott and Freddie. But once you listen to these guys and they give you some, a little bit of information about them, then you go back to the source. And so um, that's always sort of been the case in a way. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it connects with the younger ears and, and it lives on. And it's like, um, you know, carrying the torch and, and letting uh, younger people say, hey, well, you know, I, I really like that. It sounds a little bit like the White Stripes of the Black Keys. Well, the, the White Stripes and the Black Keys are the same blues that you'll listen to Walker and you, you listen to. That's a muddy wolf, B.C. King. And then, you know, then they get inspired. And so that's what I was trying to do on this record. And on this record, we, we did a lot of originals. And uh, my band, I mean, we did all the singing, all the backgrounds, all the, there was no outside fiddle players coming in. And we all sat one room and played. There was no, um, the bass player comes in on Thursday, the drummer on Tuesday, and nobody ever meets. We, I don't like recording like that. So we all record in one room at the same time to keep that, you know, that, that sort of organic feeling to the, the music. And um, it was really a pleasure making this record. And we had a, a really good producer, uh, Paul Nelson, who worked with Johnny Winters for years and uh, helped uh, resuscitate Johnny's career and work with Johnny as his guitar player also. So, you know, I had a sort of a like-minded uh, individual trying to, um, you know, flush this record out. And so it really, we're, we're very proud of it. I checked it out. And, you know, I want to touch upon a few tracks, if you don't mind real quick as i said i i grew up with you know muddy waters as a matter of fact i'll go over to my cd rack and i think i have the best of muddy waters there the self-titled track everybody wants a piece starts the cd off with straight up old school sounding blues what can you tell us briefly about that track well i thought it was sort of a new type of thing uh, but there are tracks on it that's more traditional but it's like i said it's sort of wrapped up your guitar a little bit and uh, you know have some fun playing and just let it rip you know and, and you know everybody wants a piece it's just that everybody wants a piece of what you know some people want a piece of uh, money some people want a piece of uh, recognition but that's uh, sort of a where we're coming from on that record and um, we did a various tracks uh, some tracks that uh were songs that I sort of loved and from different artists I love. Like we did uh, One Sunny Day, a Peter Green, Danny Kerwin tune. That's just great. Living around the, by the film where I got to see the real, I won't say the real Fleetwood Mac, but the first the version of Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green who wrote, who wrote by Catch a Woman and, and Oh Well and things like that. I'm sort of a amalgamation of all these different styles and that I am uh, coming up on. And there's some gospel on there, which we all in my band welcome out of singing gospel church and all that stuff. So there's some things in there like Wade in the Water traditional songs that we switched up. We did a different uh, our own arrangement. And there's uh, more a little bit of psychedelic stuff like a song called Witchcraft years ago. And uh, there's traditional blues, young girls blues, and there's gospel blues, a total instrumental where the guitar does the talking. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a wide variety of things, but that's sort of what I'm known for. I just want to clarify to you, JLW. To me, I got a lot of the typical old school sounding blues out of it. Although it's, it's newer and it's fresher, I I interpreted it that way from my experience listening to it because I, I really did I could relate to a lot of different sounds in that track through yeah. the through the whole CD another track that I really like which was witchcraft but there was another track also that I thought was super laid back and that was buzz on you is there anything you want to tell us about that particular track well that particular track the first two records I was talking about hellfire and hornet's nest the last two records before this record everybody once a piece. I worked with a great producer and he worked a lot up your way, a guy named Tom Hambridge. And uh, me and Tom worked together real good. And that was a song that Tom and Richard Fleming, his song right part that had left over from some of the sessions that, you know, that we had been doing. We did a lot of writing together and a lot of, uh, Tom is probably one of the most versatile musicians slash producers slash performers. I know he's produced so many people, Buddy Guy, D.D. King, and, and on and on and on and on. And now he's uh, produced by Quinn Sullivan. And uh, so me and Tom 
do have still a good rapport and good uh, working relationships. That song, I like that song a lot. I like little rock and roll blues and little harmony stuff, little, uh, you know, something you can play and get people's uh, juices flowing. And it seemed to lay on the record, fit on the record, right along with the other songs, you know, it wasn't a great departure. So we put it on there and had a good time doing it. It sounds like it too. I mean, every track on this CD sounds like you're having a blast. And I know artists are very, they love everything they put out, you know, not just the, from the tracks on a CD, but I'm curious to know, is there a track off of Everybody Wants a Piece that was more fun than the rest in putting it together and, and why? That's a darn good question. I, I'm just, you know, thinking uh, for a second, I, I really think that um, part of the fun with making a record and doing a track is the arranging. Because, you know, you can arrange it any number of ways. It's like painting a picture. You might want to paint with red, black, and, and blue. And then you say, oh, man, maybe that should be a little bit of white in there. Or maybe this is, you know, really make it weird. Let's put a little gray in there. And so that was the fun. And we, we had a, a great time with that, especially with Fall Back Witchcraft. Being able to, you know, to play with it and try it this way and turn it upside down and try it that way. And, you know, let's put a little harmony here and put a little harmony there. And it's starting to take shape, you know. So I think Witchcraft was one of those tracks. Yeah, that was a good track. You know, I had a question on that. You answered it. I, I really like that one a lot. You mentioned some incredible artists that you played with through the year. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Who are your top three all-time influences? And what attributes would you say you incorporate into your style and or sound from them, if any at all? Well, I mean, like I said, I play different genres. So it's really hard for me to just, you know, stick to one genre when it comes to that. I'd say in blues, of course, you know, um, making a couple records with DB, one we won the Grammy on, the Blues Summit record was uh, definitely a highlight. And um, it's see, making a, a record with uh, Peter Green, uh, the original the guy that started Fleetwood Mac uh, for me, having him call me and have me play on his record when he came back uh, called Splinter Group. Uh, that was definitely a highlight and hanging out with him for a while. And I think um, in another genre, I made a record with a guy named Branford Marsalis, which was really fun. Me, him, and B.B. Uh, King and Johnny Hooker, we made this record called I Heard You Twice the First Time, and that was fun. I like to, to me, music is music, and I'm sort of an adventurous soul coming out of the background that I told you about, so that's just three of the highlights for me, and the reason they are, with B.B., I have a little bit of a history with him, about 30 years, you know, and for him to ask me to be on his Blue Summit record was great, but also for him to take the outtake of what we did at Blue Summit, uh, our version of T-Bone Shuffle, and put it on the next record he did after that, which was all hand-picked songs that he picked. They were all live track. He went through a whole bunch of years worth of live track, and him with Gladys Knight doing a traditional uh, Betsy Smith style stuff, and to him with different people, and for him to pick my track to go on there was a, a definite honor. Uh, the thing with Peter Green was that I'm a big Peter Green fan, and, and the reason why is that Peter plays to express, not to impress. And that is, if you put on any Fleetwood Mac record, be it Oh Well or Rattlesnake Shake or, or the original Supernatural, which is just, or or the song The Supernatural. I mean, you, you get the feeling that this guy is definitely uh, from a uh, cut of another cloth than just about 99% of guitar players I heard. And the record with Bradford was a gas, of course, uh, with Bradford and Bernard Purdy and went to my cellar to people like that. And to be asked to write a song with Bradford in strange time signatures and stuff. <laughs> and all that. So, uh, you know, it, it just, I like to get out of my wheelhouse. You know, I like to be in situations where you don't normally expect. To me, that's the strength of music. When you Google something like James Brown and Pavarotti doing It's a Man's Man's World, and you see James saying right next to Pavarotti, he's singing it. Then Pavarotti sings it in a more operatic voice, but you get the same emotional feeling, you know? And you like to say, man, I'd like to have been a fly on the wall at that, you know, when they were preparing for that. <laughs> you wow. Know? So, to me, that's the fun in music. It really is. It really brings out, a, in fact, that's how American music was born. And actually, you know, you had a rock and roll invented by a guy who wanted to play country western. But due to the, the times and whatnot, Chuck Berry couldn't play country western. They wouldn't hire him at country club. He uh, invented rock and roll. You have guys like Scotty Moore, Scotty Moore and Carl Perkins who wanted to play blues. But they couldn't play it like the old guys, but they didn't want to play traditional country. So they invented rockabilly. You have groups like Booker T and MG, two African Americans, two white Americans, who are probably one of the most instrumental bands in the soul music history. You have the guys in the snake pit standing in the shadows of Motown. All those musicians totally mix Italian, black. They play on all those records. My Girl, uh, you name it. I heard it through the grapevine, blah, blah, blah. And so that, to me, is the epitome of American music. That's the music that, I won't say conquered the world, but inspired the world. 
far as I'm concerned. Wow. Yeah, and you, you know what? You're absolutely correct. Uh, it, it's mind-boggling. I mean, I sit and I talk with many artists, and you know, I'm just uh, I'm I'm visualizing what you've said, and it's like you're absolutely right. It it's it's amazing just the vast complete picture of American music in all genres and all forms. It truly is amazing to see its history and some of the people that put this all together. It, it truly is amazing, yeah. you know? And if you want to take it a step further, you could take that template and you could put it on Jimi Hendrix's back. And what he did in England with him and two English guys playing what he played and ramping the sound up, uh, ramping up the technology in the studio, he was probably the most... He used the studio as another musician the way the Beatles did. And so when you take it, he took that same template and took it to England. And to be quite honest, that was sort of what was missing in, in English bands as far as I was concerned. That connection, you know, that, that sort of connection. And that's why when you go see English bands, or when you pick a video up of the Beatles, you'll see that the fifth Beatle was really Billy Preston, you know. And the sixth Rolling Stone was really Billy Preston. If you go see the Stones now, I mean, uh, their band is totally mixed. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Jones on bass, uh, Lisa Fisher when she's singing, but Art Powell. I mean, it, it's totally mixed. And we all know that that is where the, you bring the different uh, elements and, and different inspirations, influences of, of the cultures. You get something really interesting. It's been used time and time again with Paul Simon, with Graceland, Sting with um, Blue Turtles, using a total, the total uh, African American band. He was the only black guy in his own band. <laughs> but it was a great band. Right. So it really went so, it, he was looking for a sound. And he found that sound, it, it really, it apex when he hit that song, you know, um, If You Love Somebody, Set Him Free. You know, I don't think he could have done that song with the police. The way that it was done, you know, with Branford playing the, the soprano sax and the, the subtleties and Omar King playing the drums. And I think that was Daryl Jones on bass, too. And so it's, um, I, I think anybody worth the thought will say, you know, those type of uh, collaborations and camaraderie and inventiveness and just being able to sit in the room, you know, with Peter Green and talk about, me he talks about his influence. With Luther. It's a lesson for both of us and, and it's the continuum of what guys like Muddy started when he took Bloomfield under his wing and Johnny Winters and Meg McKee that when Wolf took Bill Wyman under his wing. Well, you know, I mean, Muddy kept on doing that, kept on doing that, kept on doing that. And so uh, that sort of um, uh, passing on the music, I think, is what keeps the music alive. So true. I wholeheartedly agree with you. From what I'm seeing and from what I understand, you are out on tour right now doing some select shows. There's one in particular in Shirley Mass on December 9th at the Bull Run. What can you tell us about this show and what can the fans expect to see from this show? And here. Well, I mean, I, I like playing the Bull Run. Uh, every time I play there, some of my friends come out. I mean, a couple of times ago I played there, um, Ronnie Earl came out. My friend Jay Giles, he comes out and uh, then me and Jay did some uh, B.B. King tributes after B.B. died because Jay was big and still is a big B.B. fan and he was affected by Bloomfield because Bloomfield sort of gave the Jay Giles band their first break. <laughs> so, you know, there's that continuum I'm talking about and Jay never forgot it and so we definitely had a mutual admiration society and a mutual sort of history, you know, and so uh, when the Bull Run is so much fun you know, some of my friends like that show up and what have you and so it, it always uh, makes me feel good to have and show up and have the people are very knowledgeable at the Bull Run. They have great shows. It's got history in this music and I really um, enjoy playing clubs like that because, you know, they, they're sort of in it for the long haul. It's just not about making a buck. They're part of the, uh, sort of keeping the blues, you know, where musicians can, can have a decent gig and they have people there that are plugged in to come and hear the music and the musicians in the area. So it's a win-win situation. I've covered shows across the board, not just, you know, blues or old classic rock or new heavy metal but I gotta be honest with you some of the smaller venues and or clubs are probably the best because it's much more personal yeah. I could see why you would like the show at the Bull Run and why you'd want to play there of course on all accounts Joe Lewis Walker tears it up with a provocative style blues that grooves with every track what can we look forward to from Joe Lewis Walker in the foreseeable future that we might not know about. Well, um, I've sort of done a lot of tracks for more of a soul record, and I'm sort of lining up some friends to sing on it with me. And so that's what I've been sort of wanting to do for quite a few years. Another one, I did one in the 80s called Blue Soul, but it was just me doing it mostly all the singing, although I did have uh, David Doggo on there from my solo play accordion, and I had the Memphis horns, but um, I wanted to do something where it's more vocal, uh, 
perpetuated and with some friends of mine that I've signed with over the years. Some of them known, some of them not so known. Very cool. That sounds great. Definitely. A little bit of soul never hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. I got to remember that one. Yeah. This one never hurt anybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's right. Hey, like you said, it's an amalgamation of all of it coming together. And, you know, you wanting to do soul, I'm, I'm not saying the blues aren't part of the soul and or vice versa, but that's taking it in another area that you want to explore. And that, to me, is amazing in itself. It's so in-depth. It really is. And it takes a lot of talent, a lot of talent. I could never do what you do, man. Never. <laughs> well, thank you, Adam. You could if you wanted, you know, just devoting all that time. But all the mutual called John Rock, they're all cousins. You know, I mean, gospel and blues and soul are dead gospel and soul, especially are cousins. Blues and gospel are cousins. Country and blues are cousins. Jazz and blues are cousins. I mean, you know, like Muddy Waters said, blues had a baby and named it rock and roll. You know, <laughs> he could have been blues had a baby and named it a lot of things. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So true. You're so right, though. It, and that's the thing. It, it It's all related. You know, I've said it a million times. I grew up on, you know, Charlie Pride and Ray Price and Tom Jones. You know, some, some Motown, even. It's incredible stuff. I want to personally thank you for your contribution to it all. You can't say everybody is into it, but the people that are, you've made a great contribution to it. So I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Anytime, man. JLW, Joe Lewis Walker, I want to take the time now to say thank you for taking the time to speak with us here at NECR New England Concert Reviews. I wish you the best with Everybody Wants a Piece. I wish you the best with doing shows. I wish you the best in the future with doing some soul stuff as well. I wish you all the best with it all. Keep on pumping it out, man, because I love listening to it. Well, the feeling's mutual. Thank you so much for having me on any time. Thank you, Greg, so much. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was blues artist Joe Lewis Walker. I am Greg, a.k.a. Crazy G, from NECI New England Concert Reviews, and I will be back. I'm out of here. Peace.